Welcome to New Day Cleveland. I'm Natalie Hervick and I am here at Playhouse Square. And around this time of year, that can only mean one thing. It is time for our season on sale show. Yes, tickets for the 2017-2018 Key Bang Broadway series go on sale today at 11 o'clock. So we're going to highlight those performances throughout the hour. We're going to talk to Art Falco, get a little update from him on what's happening in the neighborhood, check out some new restaurants, and give you some insider tips too. And we are going to start with a show that has pretty incredible music. It's Waitress. The day starts like the rest we've seen in Well, there's so much excitement about Waitress, the musical when it comes to Playhouse Square. For starters, the national tour is launching here from the Connor Palace Theater. So what that means is that all the creators, all the producers, the entire company is going to be here creating that show, putting it together, and from Cleveland it rolls out to the nation. So we're really delighted and honored to be uh, launching this delicious show because it is a nice slice of uh, showbiz, as you might say. It's, it's the story of Jenna Hunterson. She is a, a waitress, she's an expert pie baker, and she is involved in this loveless marriage to this crusty guy named Earl and he's every bit of an earl that you might think. And so she is really thinking about how she might get out of this situation. And so she is saving money, actually, in the hopes of two things. She wants to someday open her own pie shop, and then she also learns about a pie baking contest in a nearby town. And so she hopes to win that, that contest, that it will set her free. What happens is that she has an unexpected pregnancy. And out of that pregnancy, then she begins to worry about all of her dreams fading away. She is absolutely trapped uh, working at Joe's Diner and Pie Shop, which has, you know, you see the menagerie of people that come into the shop, you know, uh, a lovely older man, a kind of quirky younger guy, uh, you know, the kind of crazy cook, her friends, Becky and Dawn, they're all there working together in this pie shop. And so it is their town, it's their life, it's their nucleus. But what she discovers is that the child changes her life and gives her a direction and sets her free ultimately. So it's a very empowering story about holding on to your dreams, uh, allowing life to bring you new dreams and new opportunities. Uh, it, it, it is also very a very true story about how we live our lives. You know, our lives aren't a fairy tale. They're messy. And I think baking pies is the perfect metaphor for that. I am a pie baker. I love making pies, but I will tell you it's messy business. I always have flour all over. You know, you always there's a cleanup that's always necessary, and that I think is again the perfect setup for how our lives actually work out. She ends up actually having an affair with her doctor and Again, messy, he's married, and she needs to, and so she. And so she needs to figure out how to extract herself from that, from that and actually get her on a path. And her daughter Lulu does that. She eventually opens her own pie shop. Make that coffee strong enough. As if the musical itself isn't cool enough, this is the first musical, Broadway musical, in the history of the business where all of the creatives, the top creative slots, are all filled by women. That's never happened before. Uh, directed by Diane Paulus, who brought us Pippin. Uh, the book is written by Jesse Nelson. The choreographer is Lauren Lataro. And of course, the composer is the wonderful Sarah Borales. And they've just announced that she's going into the Broadway show beginning March 31st. Opening Sarah up. Borales, to me, accomplishes something that few pop composers do, that she really understands when she's composing how to crawl inside of a character and write for that character, both male and female. I have an idea. We just saw a show with delicious food. Why not check out one of the newest restaurants here in Playhouse Square? There are so many great options when it comes to meals down here at Playhouse Square. This, since the last time I was here, is new, and let me tell you, you are not going to want to miss it. Puente Viejo. I did it, David. You did it? I did it. Fabulous. Okay. Mexican food restaurant here. I mean, you have outdone yourself. Of course, we come during your crazy lunch hour, and it's just nuts. But we, I'm glad we got to get we you down in you a seat here. and we talk to you it. about your delicious and huge portions of food. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it's it. Awesome. We appreciate it. Can we get into the meals right away? And Absolutely. They're still steaming. Absolutely. 
Where this. you want to start? Please tell me these are at least dinner portions you brought out. These are absolutely dinner okay. portions. They're, I mean, yes. now I understand why people have been saying that you definitely needed to go box half the time. Yeah, you're going to need a big bag to get this home. Let's start with this one. All right, that's the uh, quesadilla chipotle, and it's a crowd favorite. Probably one of our most popular dinner items. Um, grilled chicken, jalapeno, uh, nice chipotle sauce. Mm. Do you have Topped with cheese. Cheese. Now, this is regular cheese, or is it the sauce the that same, I also same had to queso try? queso that you had. Yes. I tried some of their queso sauce. Mind blowing. Okay, so Thank that's you. what it's topped with. Yes. And you get a nice little nice side, side salad. salad. Yes. It's not a little one either. Okay, up front is a fajita. So, is it yep. a take on fajitas? That we that's have. Your that's the combo mm -hmm. fajita. That's the steak, chicken, and shrimp. Uh, sometimes chef puts uh, scallops in that as well on the customer's Ooh. request. Seafood is second to none. I, a lot of pride in our seafood. So if you like seafood, uh, dishes are fantastic. Are you a big seafood lover and that's why you really take a lot of pride in that? Or I, I am that and, and chef, uh, chef loves seafood as well. Okay. So, yes. All right, now I, I must add when I when I go to most restaurants, the, the, the portions even of the rice and the veggies don't look as big as this. It's huge. It's a lot of food. I, now, talk about a meal here. I don't even know where to begin with this one. That is, uh, that's new on our menu. It's called a mocajeta and uh, very similar to the fajita where it comes out on a steaming skillet, only this is a uh, steaming bowl. So the meal actually finishes cooking in the bowl as it's brought out. Uh, he brought a combo as well, that's chicken, steak, and seafood, uh, and that feeds two, maybe three people. I would say, so, depending on who you're with, you exactly. can definitely get three people out of that. Exactly. Now please tell me these are two to three people too. Yeah, those are, those are the jumbos. Um, <laughs> he outdid himself with those today. What, are these? So, they're not, are they margaritas? They are, yep. That's our blue Hawaiian margarita, which is our special today. Now, do you suggest people have these on their lunch break? I don't know about that. We, Maybe we don't, dinner? We don't see a lot of that on the lunch break. <laughs> uh, not a lot, but... Uh, well, I'm glad I got to, right. to buck the trend here and I got to be a part of this. That is, so this is how they're served normally. The, the jumbo is served like that. The jumbo is served like, and it's normally for two, again. Okay. Yes. Which helps some. Yes. How late are you open until? Uh, during the week, we're open until nine. Kitchen closes at nine. We keep the bar open, full service bar. We'll keep the bar open until there's no one here. So you can come get a dinner before the show and then you come get a drink after the show. Absolutely. And then get an Uber home. That's right. After you have one of these babies. Definitely Uber home. <laughs> and, it, and then on the weekends, we'll stay open until 12, one o'clock. Again, depending upon, we're very much event driven down here. Uh, so if there are shows, we try to accommodate and stay open later, uh, or if there's a game or something like that. So very much event driven, we're finding out. So when you're kind of tucked away just a little bit, you're here in Playoff Square in the district, um, but right behind the plaza area. Yes. So you just have to walk a little bit closer towards downtown and you'll find you. Right. You, you can't miss the uh, yellow umbrellas outside too. Right. Just got the patio open uh, a couple of months ago. We're excited about that. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun. We're having a good time down here. Fun. Can we do a cheers with these? Absolutely. Let's do it. Absolutely. And then after this, we're digging in. Cheers. cheers. We'll be back after the break. Thanks for coming. Welcome back to our show. It's time to get off your couch and get on your feet. The next show is about the life of Gloria and Emilio Estefan. And they went from Cuban immigrants to basically Grammy award-winning superstars. Check it out. So things will really heat up at Playhouse Square in December when On Your Feet comes here. I will tell you, first of all, when I saw the musical, I had A, forgotten how much of Gloria Stefan's music I knew and how much of it I loved. It's appropriately titled On Your Feet and I think it's a great challenge to not be dancing for this whole show because it is so infectious. You know, we hear about Gloria's life. She was born in Havana in 1957. Her father is Jose Garcia, uh, her mother is Gloria Fajardo, and her father actually was a soldier and was the bodyguard for Elisa Batista who is the wife of the dictator. So in the Cuban Revolution, when, when Castro took hold, uh, January 1st, 1959, they all left. They got out on Pan Am flight, went to Miami, which is where she then grew up. So we see Gloria in her young days with her mother who is domineering, 
wanting her to have you know this education she actually went to the University of Miami and has a degree in psychology her father who she dearly loved who ailed actually from his service in Vietnam but she goes to a wedding in 1975 and there's a band playing at the wedding called the Miami Latin Boys and the fellow who's the keyboard player asks her if she wants to sit in for a set she does, and two years later she joins that band, they change their name to the Miami Sound Machine, and the keyboard player is Emilio Stefan, who becomes her one and only love in life. So this is a great love story for the two of them, but you see it from the very beginning, from the very first spark, to their explosion in the uh, recording, in the pop industry. You see how they have experienced um, racism, how so many radio stations didn't want to give them a chance, didn't think they, their music would cross over, and in fact, between the two of them, they have 26 Grammys. It is a night that is fun, it sings, it tells you the story about her great life, it brings to mind, and we remember about the bus accident in 1990, that we were all so fearful that she was going to, would she ever walk again, much less perform again? And then we see her triumphant return to the stage 10 months later. Because of her life as a pop singer, which is a track that her mother did not want her to take, you see how the gift of the accident is the reuniting of her with her mother and how they then rebuild their relationship together. It's really quite wonderful. So, you know, it's sort of like out of tragedy come these gifts to us in life, and um, certainly that's done so for Gloria, and, you know, her contribution just to, uh, to the music scene. It's wonderful to talk about how immigrants have come to the United States and the contribution that they make and the, the firm commitment to, to contribute to our society and my heavens, it, the music is great. You know, when you think about I, I Never Want to Leave You, On Your Feet, of course, her great song, like her signature song, was Conga. And I will tell you, when you hear this music and you see these dancers, they do it so well, you actually believe you could do it. <laughs> and that's the wonderful thing. It takes you, it takes us out of the winter, out of the December snowy months, into the hottest place you could possibly go, and that will be the Connor Palace when On Your Feet comes to Playhouse Square. You know, some of the first people you meet are the people in red when you come to the shows. These are people who give so much of their time to make sure that you have a good time. It's time to read the red coats. You know, if you come to see one of these incredible shows, you'll always be greeted with smiling faces and people dressed in red. I'm talking about the Redcoats, of course. I know you know them, and this woman knows them all too well. Gina, it's a fun job, isn't it? It's have. a great job, yes. So I should say, it is a job, but in a way, they're really volunteers. They come here and they donate their time at Playhouse Square. What is it, what does it mean to be a Redcoat? Um, I think it means giving back to your community and joining the Playhouse Square family. And um, I think that everybody really enjoys their time here and enjoys supporting the arts and the Cleveland community as a whole. So what do they technically do? The Redcoats do a variety of tasks. They scan tickets and direct people in lobbies. They seat our guests um, when they're coming into shows. Um, they work in the house manager's office. So they do all of the things that are needed to direct people into the performance. And I know that so many people who I've spoken with who are already red coats absolutely love what they do down here. But if someone is interested in doing this as well, who is best to do something like this? Anybody 18 or over who has a great personality and a great smile is welcome <laughs> to join us. Um, I told you I was right about the smiles, right? <laughs> That's right. They always have big smiles on their faces. <laughs> <laughs> so, but really then, any, I mean, I guess then you would wonder, oh, is there a lot of commitment to it? What are the time constraints with this kind of thing? It's very flexible. People can choose the day and time that works best for them. Uh, so you could choose a Saturday evening or a Sunday matinee, and then you would only be scheduled on those times, usually between two and four times a month. And any time that you can't make it work, you can always cancel with us. And if you find something else that you'd like to work at, you can add it as an extra. Enjoy the show. I think everybody loves the red coats. I think it's a nice, warm, welcoming smile when people come in and somebody you always know you can identify who will help you out. Um, and people, you know, we get compliments on our red coats all the time. 
So what kind of feedback do you get from the people who are already Redcoats? The Redcoats love it. They have a great time here. They feel a real sense of community and they love being a part of the arts community here. Well, you know, we actually got a chance to speak with a few of them because I had asked them personally what they think is the best part about their jobs. We decided to be volunteers because we both retired and found that we had extra time and wanted to do something. From the minute I get up to put this coat on, to come down, it, it's a feel of need that I, that, that I want to help somebody, okay? Um, being a red coat is just, that fills that need, okay? It, it, it fills a void in a way from retirement of every day sitting at home. So I work a full-time job. Um, when I get to come down to the theater, I get to interact with the general public in a really positive and happy way. Everybody's coming here for a really happy experience. I get to help participate in their experience. And in doing that, you really do get back what you give out. And I get to have a fun time, see great performances, see great concerts or comedy or whatever's going on that night. And I go home feeling really happy and calm and just ready to relax. We definitely need more, especially with our expanding season this year. Um, we're looking for more and more red coats. So how can they get involved? Uh, anytime you want to get involved, you can go to our website. Under the Giving and Support tab, there's a tab for volunteering and fill out a form there. Who knows? We might see you as one of the red coats with the big smiles always That's on right. their faces. <laughs> we'll have more from Playhouse Square after this short break. We'll see you then. Welcome back to our season on sale show here at Playhouse Square. The next show happens to be the sequel to Phantom of the Opera. So if you're wondering what happened to Christine, Raul, or the Phantom, you'll find out in Love Never Dies. Love Never Dies is going to be here in January. So what's so interesting about Andrew Lloyd Webber's Love Never Dies is that it gives us the opportunity to see something we haven't seen before. We understand prequels. We understand with Wicked what happened before Dorothy landed in Oz. We understand with Peter and the Starcatcher how Peter Pan came to be. So we have the setups. Now we've got the sequel to what happened after Raoul rescued Christine Daae from the caverns of the Paris Opera House. So it's set in 1907 on Coney Island. Now, Andrew Lloyd Webber, when thinking about what might happen for the Phantom, he disappears at the end of the opera. We never really know what happens to him and what's next, but it's really clear that he has an undying love for Christine Daae. So Andrew Lloyd Webber was thinking, if the Phantom has disappeared, if he has been like uh, driven out of France, where would the Phantom possibly go? And he thought it would be likely he'd come to the United States, and most likely that he would go to Coney Island. He's disfigured, he's a freak, he's a social outcast. And so at Coney Island, among the freaks and snake charmers, he would almost go unnoticed, right? He'd fit right in. So that's where he is. And, and we see then that he is running a show there and that it is his chance for Christine Daae to sing for him once more. She actually is coming to the United States in the story to sing for Oscar Hammerstein. And in fact, it turns out that the mysterious man she's singing for is the Phantom. So we really see how Christine is here with her husband Raoul, her son, and the mystery of who might be the father of the son actually emerges. This tour of the United States is gonna be its premiere in the United States. It has played in Australia, it's played in Hamburg, Germany, and now in January will be premiering in the United States. It's a deeply personal story for Andrew Lloyd Webber. You know, he is the Phantom of the Opera. He wrote this for his muse. He wrote it for his wife and his love, Sarah Brightman. And as an artist, he wasn't done when he wrote Phantom of the Opera. Clearly, love never dies, not only for the Phantom, but for the composer as well. It's a way to relive one of the greatest stories that have ever been told, and to do all that right here at the Connor Palace in January. Love never dies, you'll never forget it. 
We're going to take a break from the shows just for a second and speak with the president and CEO of Playhouse Square, Art Falco, to see what's new in the neighborhood. You know, there is a lot of excitement surrounding Playhouse Square, and the man who is best to explain that to all of us is the president and CEO, Mr. Art Falco. It's so good to have you join us for our show today. Oh, it's so great to be here. You know, there's so many fascinating, exciting things happening, one of them being a big apartment complex uh, that you're creating. Uh, yes. In fact, right behind us is a parking lot, and we're in the final design phases of a 34-story, 319-unit apartment complex with 550-car parking garage. Now, on top of that, the hotel is changing. You know, the Wyndham is yes. changing names. Yes, yes, it is changing. The uh, We've had a management contract with Wyndham for over 20 years and they're a fine company. We've decided that it, it made sense to have a brand change. Uh, we needed to upgrade the hotel, uh, it needed refreshing, so mm -hmm. all of the hotel rooms, the public spaces, the restaurant, the pool, will we'll have a new hotel and it will be part of the IHG, the Inter Intercontinental Hotel Group, uh, and it will become a, a Crown Plaza. So we're very, very excited about that. That is phenomenal news. And then I think that the one thing that a lot of people, especially because of the names we're seeing coming this season, are so excited that you have the expanded weeks for people to come and watch the shows. Well, you're right. We have an unbelievable season. And certainly True. the top show is Hamilton that everyone will want to see. But we also have a subscription base that is now approaching 44,000 people which is the largest subscription base in the country. Larger than Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Washington, Dallas. It really is remarkable for a city our size. When you think about that, that statement alone, the magnitude of that, we're feeding cities all over the country. It just shows the need, I think, for this theater district because people absolutely enjoy it. Absolutely, and people are coming from all over, not just Northeast Ohio but from around the country because we're able to entice producers to, to bring their shows to Cleveland early. So you're seeing all of the best performers on the stage. Now I know that there is a wonderful campaign that you have as well going on and there's some big news when it comes to that as well. Well, you're right. <laughs> we have a campaign, a small $100 million campaign called Advancing the Legacy. Just a small. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we are now at $90 million attainment hope to complete it within the next uh, nine months. And it's all about Playhouse Square and its future. Uh, it's all about uh, retrofitting and upgrading some of the theaters that were renovated 25 and 30 years ago. It's about um, providing transportation funds for schools and children uh, because schools are more challenged. It's about enticing producers to bring some of their Broadway shows pre-Broadway to work on their product here in Playhouse Square, and it's about uh, what we call a theater preservation fund, which is a fund then that will spin off the two to three million dollars each year necessary to maintain these beautiful theaters. So it's really looking at Playhouse Square, not just today, mm -hmm. but 30 and 50 years from today. And we want to keep this number one status that we have in the country, you know, and, and it takes money to do so. And if people love what they see and are doing now here at Playhouse Square, you do, you want to keep the legacy living on. Yes. And we could still use a few more donations. Now, how can people do that? They can contact us. Uh, they can contact me uh, directly, and I will put them in touch with our development department, and we can talk about wonderful opportunities. There's so many opportunities right now, and there's so many more to come in the future, and that is why I love this district down here. Art, thank you so much. You're welcome. And guess what? Our show is continuing on. We'll have much more from Playhouse Square after this short break. Welcome back to our season on sale show here at Playhouse Square. The next one is one that is going to thrill rent heads. That's because Rent is celebrating its 20th anniversary and you do not want to miss this one. Rent, now. Now we go to a more contemporary opera with Rent, also actually influenced by Puccini. It's loosely based on La Boheme and it tells the story of seven artists who are living in this spiky, 
uh, dark area of the East Village in the height of the AIDS virus, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. So we hear about these artists who are uh, striving to survive, can't pay the rent, and the friends that they live with and they're around them are composed of the throwaways of society. They are the prostitutes and the drug addicts and the forgotten souls of our world. And they have all come together to create this celebration of how you as an artist find your place. How do you find your voice? Even if the world has forgotten you, it's the hard life of an artist to keep moving ahead. And that has been captured so beautifully in Jonathan Larson's Rent. It's hard to believe that it has been over 20 years since it first premiered. It was outrageous. It was groundbreaking when it first premiered. And today we look at Rent and it's, you know, this favorite chestnut. You think of Seasons of Love, like that wonderful anthem at the top of Act Two. And for everyone who thinks about this music, they're like, ah, Rent. And it is wonderful what time sort of does and how time changes our perspective. Because at that point in our lives, we may have been the struggling young person. Whether you're struggling with college debt, you're struggling to get out of your parents' basements, the struggle for young people never ends. And it has become the anthem for generations. This musical launched so many careers. Of course, Jonathan Larson sadly didn't live to see the success of this show. But despite that, his music and these anthems and the meaning of this show has been so much a part of our culture that it has launched so many careers. Idina Menzel, she was in the original cast. She was an unknown young singer who came in to uh, make her own. So you can really see how this musical, for what it stood for, which was giving artists and giving people you didn't know about a voice, has certainly done that for so many. So Rent is going to be back here. It will be at the Connor Palace in March. We're moving on now to the only play this season, and it happens to be a Tony Award winner. This is the humans. If you're so miserable, why are you trying to live forever? <laughs> As a nonprofit, one of our many missions at Playhouse Square is to stretch your world and occasionally stretch you out of your comfort zone. And to do that, we have brought you the Tony Award winning play, The Humans. It's a story about a family who is celebrating Thanksgiving in Chinatown. Mom and Dad, Eric and Deidre, are, have driven in from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and he's brought with them uh, his mother, Momo, who is elderly, she's in a wheelchair, she's suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and they're there to see their two daughters. Amy is a lawyer from Philadelphia who's just been dumped by her girlfriend, and the other daughter, Bridget, who is an aspiring musician, maybe of marginal talent, who has just moved in with her boyfriend, Richard. Richard actually seems to come from a little money. He's trying really hard to fit in, but he's clearly the outsider in this gathering. So they have gathered in this windowless apartment in Chinatown. And the apartment itself has a descending cascade of functionality. Light bulbs are burning out. Doors don't close properly. They hear the noise of the person upstairs and the noise continues to get louder and louder. But what you actually learn through this is that you are seeing it through the lens of the father. For me, that's whose lens I see it through. And it really speaks somewhat to our fears. And to the parents, you always want better for your children. The next generation always, you hope, is going to succeed more, do more, have more. So think about this fellow who is a middle class, out of work, maintenance worker who comes to visit his daughter in New York City who is living in this crummy, crusty, windowless place. And think if you're the parents and what you're thinking about of, oh my heavens, like how could this possibly be happening? You see physically when you look at the set, it's a two-story set. Uh, it's actually designed by David Zinn, who is a Tony Award winning designer who was actually here for Fun Home. But you see that it's a two story set and there aren't, there aren't, they have just moved in, so there's not a lot of furniture, so therefore there are not a lot of options. You really understand how the set plays a role essentially as a character, literally setting the stage. So 
just a few folding chairs, not a lot of options, nothing is comfortable. The set actually sits on the stage at a slight angle and the, there is nowhere to rest. The characters are constantly in motion. Again, really speaking to the state of their lives. What holds them together is their deep love for each other. This family is a Catholic Irish family and despite the hardships, despite the challenges, despite the lost loves, despite what might be your aspirations for a career that may or may not ever come about, the parents are there, the children are there, and even though they're drinking wine out of Dixie cups at Thanksgiving, they're there to celebrate it together. And that is actually the story, is the enduring power of the love of this family. So if you think about your book club as an example, Think about the conversations that you love to have about well-written books because that's what this experience is like. The humans, it will be at Playhouse Square and it will be one of those plays that will hang in your brain and stay with you for a long time. She's not your mother-in-law unless you get <laughs> We still have more performances to get to. After the break, it's Aladdin. You've been with me all my life. I know this now. I've grown up under your roof, burrowed deep in your seats, lost in the lights. I've seen a lot here, the sadness and the exultation, memories not left behind but still alive in my beating heart. Pictures in my mind, beautiful snapshots, a collection of all the things that made me who I would become. I've grown up, and you have too. Through trouble and good times, we've built a place here, together. And it's here, between these walls, under your shelter, inspiration takes flight, magic is conjured, and dreams become real. You are essential and timeless, and we are here together. You've been with me all my life, and I'm finally beginning to see you for what you truly are. Another performance and this is one the whole family is going to enjoy. It's time to take a magic carpet ride with Disney's Aladdin. So now we go to a show that gives you a genie, a love story, and then the magic carpet ride. It's spectacular, it's beautiful, it jumps, it's the music by Alan Menken, and it's Disney's Aladdin. It's going to be here in May. You know, the story of Aladdin is the story of this street urchin. He is this young fellow whose mother has died and he is a scavenger on the streets looking for anything that he can to survive. Uh, whether that's a way to like make a couple bucks, whether it's a way to grab a bite to eat, that's Aladdin's life. It actually takes place in the fictional city of Agrabah. Agrabah is located along the Spice Route. The Spice Route, you might remember, is the waterway that takes us from Western Japan, across Indonesia, across Southern Asia, Northern Africa, and into Europe. So the cities that are along that route are the cities that are exciting, electric, they jump, it's where cultures come together. And when you see the setting of the spice market, it is these bold, vibrant colors that are just so luscious that you just, it, it, it speaks to the spice market, right? All the things you think about spices, the electrifying sensations that we have in our brains, in our bodies, when we think of spicy food, you see it actually visually, both in the set and the costumes for the show. What's so wonderful about this kind of a production is that the costume designer, Greg Barnes, 
designs this with such detail that all of the beading, there's a lot of beading in the show, it's all hand done. The costumes are all hand painted. Everybody has a highly decorated costume, except for Aladdin. You know, Aladdin is very plain. That's his life. He doesn't have a lot of resources, and he literally stands out on stage. We meet Aladdin, and we see the, how the story of Aladdin is that he goes into the Cave of Wonders, where he finds the magic lamp that gives him three wishes. And of those three wishes, he ultimately figures out how to free his friends, how to free the genie, how to have a life. And at one point in time, he's actually pretending to be a prince, hoping to attract the heart of Jasmine, who is the princess whose father is, uh, her father the sultan is actually um, a little frustrated that she keeps dismissing all of her suitors. And here comes this fellow pretending to be a prince who is Aladdin, ultimately, by Aladdin realizing that he has to accept who he is, the Sultan accepts him, and literally he and Jasmine leave on this magic carpet ride, which is a wonderful way to think about how your life takes off, how you ascend. When you make the right decisions, right, you take flight. It moves in a way that is absolutely electrifying. I cannot wait for audiences to see this, for families, young and old alike, are going to love their evening at Aladdin. It'll be here in May, and it'll be the perfect way to like end the school year or begin your summer for the KeyBank Broadway series. Think that's awesome? Wait until you see what we have in store after the break. It is the show that everyone is talking about. You know what I mean. We'll see you when we get back. We have saved the best for last. I have one line for you. What's his name, man? Alexander Hamilton. I'm past patiently waiting. I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every action. Hamilton, we're done. <laughs> it's the biggest thing that's ever happened in showbiz. It's unbelievable how a hip hop musical, a hip hop opera, basically, has made history so cool again. This is Lynn manuel Miranda's masterpiece. And the man's so young, there's so much more to come out of him. But he has written this musical that's based on the founding father on the $10 bill, who I think most of us would have been a little strapped to figure out what he'd done in his life. So what you learn is about Alexander Hamilton's extraordinary contributions to our world. You know, he was born penniless in the Caribbean. He came to the United States uh, and became George Washington's chief of staff. He was brash, he was bold, and smart as you can imagine. He created the U.S. Mint, he created the Coast Guard, he created the New York Post. Uh, it, it's just, it's unbelievable what this man actually did. And how did we not know this? But thanks to this musical, it's now the coolest bit of information to know. Now here's the thing that everybody needs to know. Before you see Hamilton, you have two homework assignments. One is you have to download that cast recording. You have to listen to it because it is so rich, it's so full of information that if your ear isn't tuned to that hip hop sound at the very beginning, it's gonna take off and leave you. So make sure that you've listen to that because it's beautiful and you'll be so happy to understand those lyrics and then see them performed on stage. So you have that little bit of assignment and also to learn something about Alexander Hamilton. You don't have to necessarily read the book though that's also Ron Chernow's book is a beautiful read uh, but know something about Alexander Hamilton's place in history know when he lived, know about his marriage to Elizabeth, know about his disagreements with Burr, who ultimately shot him in a duel. Uh, just like I said, has the sense of 
his, his work as a soldier, his work as a, a very loyal American, and his commitment as a, an immigrant to the United States to make an impact and make this country something better than it had ever been. So here's the big question everybody wants to know is how do you get tickets to Hamilton? At this point in time, the best advice I have for you is to be a season ticket holder or to be a donor because tickets are going to be in such high demand that if you want to make sure you can secure your seats, those are the two ways we recommend. We know that single tickets are going to go on sale in the spring of 2018, but if you want to make sure that you're in the room where and when it happens, I suggest that you be a season ticket holder and a donor to the KeyBank Broadway series. It's the most in-demand ticket in New York City. It's the ticket you can't get. And now it's going to be here in Cleveland, Ohio. It will be with us for six weeks in July and August. So we are so lucky to snag all of this time for Hamilton to be with us. It's just going to be one of those nights that's going to be a spectacular event, the event of the summer. It will be here in 2018, Hamilton, the KeyBank Broadway series. It just doesn't get any better than this. Well, you've seen the shows, but now, buyer beware, here are a few things you need to know before buying your tickets. There are so many incredible shows making their way here to Playhouse Square this upcoming season. But before you buy your tickets, Cindy here is going to help us out because there are a lot of things that consumers should think about when purchasing. So the most important thing is when you're purchasing tickets online, make sure you're purchasing at PlayhouseSquare.org. That way you know you are purchasing tickets that are not higher than face value and price. Good point. Tickets that really exist because unfortunately sometimes it happens where third parties sell tickets that don't actually exist in our theaters. Oh. We can reprint your tickets for you if they get lost or stolen. And if there's any news about the show, we'll be able to contact you. So for example, if there's a time change or if there's construction coming off the highway towards the theaters, we can let you know about that. So that's why it's really important to make sure you're purchasing directly from Playhouse Square or a licensed group or travel leader. Because I'm sure that someone has accidentally gone the wrong route and then they've come to you at Playhouse Square saying, what can you do about this? I'm not quite sure there's anything you can do about it at that point in time. That's true. We, we really do try to take care of our guests, but for example, if a show is sold out and you are holding tickets for a seat that doesn't actually exist, or we've also seen third parties sell the same tickets multiple times, so we could have two, three, four sets of guests holding the same tickets, mm. and if the show's sold out, there's really nothing that we can do for you. The other um, pitfall is that if you do purchase tickets from a third party and pay more, you may, you're likely to pay more than face value. When, if you come to PlayhouseSquare.org, you could find tickets for face value, so you're saving money. But also, if you purchase tickets from a third party, uh, we, in order to protect our guests, if we find out that tickets are being sold for more than face value, we will revoke those tickets. And if you end up with tickets that have been revoked, you'll come to the show and you won't have tickets for the show and we won't be able to admit you. And we really don't want that to happen. No, because when you think about all the great shows coming this season, there are some you just don't want to miss. That's right. So that's why we really want to make sure that people are purchasing from Playhouse Square, either at playhousesquare.org or by calling 216-241-6000 or from a licensed group or travel leader so that they definitely have the tickets for the show that they want to see, they're going to have a guaranteed seat, they won't be overpaying, and they're going to come and have a great time. Do it the right way. You do not want to miss out. That is the worst case scenario there. That's All right. right. Thank you, Cindy. You're welcome. What an incredible lineup of shows. Now, if you want to buy tickets to all of them, like I would love to, you can do that. If you'd like to buy tickets individually for your favorite ones, you can do that too. As a reminder though, the two shows that do not go on sale today at 11 o'clock right now are Hamilton and Aladdin, but you can always stay updated with PlayhouseSquare.org. We'll give you the most up-to-date information on when they will also go on sale. I'm Natalie Herbick, and I'll see you on the next New Day Cleveland. Have fun at the theater.